Okay. Yeah. And it's an honor for me to introduce the next speaker, Ian Gilchrist, and he's gonna the, he's gonna uh, talk about more lean things. <laughs> uh, we're gonna see if we can get this hooked up. Shall I hook it? I got my own. Uh, No sound. Bingo. Okay, we we have contact here. Okay, I was uh, first. I want to. Thank Dr. Kimmony for inviting me, and on top of that, um, being the only uh, North American over here, I'm quite honored. Um, in any case, the topic uh, that I was uh, charged with giving a, a uh, brief talk on is uh, lean hospitalization, and um, like, um, I wasn't sure about the word hospitalization because we actually don't hospitalize our patients anymore, but uh, lean hospitalization, I guess, uh, leaves open the possibility that you might get into the hospital under, under my care. In any case, um, for I, I picked up radial um, secondhand out of Quebec um, in the mid '90s, and um, it, it seemed like such an eloquent solution. Um, you had this beautiful result. Um, right now, we're as far as our, our leanness. We're doing uh, four French for diagnostics, four French for right hearts, um, and five French for interventions. But we have this nice tools, nice technology, but our administrators were telling us that, you know, basically the hospital would make more money if you would just tell the patient to stay overnight. And I ended up telling the hospital administrator that for safety reasons and patient care, I, they didn't have to stay overnight as far as I was concerned. And um, if they would like the patient to stay overnight to keep the hospital coffers full, I'd be more than happy to have them come back down and you know, give their story to the patient. And if they agreed to stay overnight, I'd be more than happy to follow suit. Um, the administrators never bothered with that. But uh, this concept of can't we take our technology and turn it into a whole um, uh, healthcare um, process and make it smoother is what I've been interested in for the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Well, one of the pr first perceptions that you run into or we ran into was um, there, there's a lot of thought out there that you go to the hospital um, for a little relaxation, a little R&R. &R. And, you know, patients are upset. They don't get a good night's sleep in the hospital. Nurses kept them up. And you're wondering, you know, it would have been cheaper to go to the four-star hotel in our town, the Hershey Hotel, rather than sp you know spend a night in our hospital. And that's that that's not what happens in a hospital. Um, the other perception around the time I started to do this was in the U.S. At least we had uh, what were called drive-through deliveries, where the woman had the baby and she was out the door within 23 hours. And there was this concept that drive-throughs may not be the best thing. Um, it turns out that. There's a big difference between delivering a baby, which I've never done, and uh, having coronary disease, which I don't have. The one is suddenly the woman is, is one, exhausted and, and has a new, new person to take care of and is terrified of what's going on and just it, there's just too many things going on. The person with coronary disease may be scared of their diagnosis, but they want to go home and be with the people that they know, where they feel comfortable, and they certainly don't want to be in a cold metal environment um, where their family is told they can only visit for a certain amount of time per day. So we, those of us in this room probably realize that when grandma enters the hospital, you know, she 
really enters a toxic environment. And it's not a week goes by in, in our papers that there's not some article about some infection caught in the hospital or some mistake made in the hospital. And the hospitals really are not the spa that some people have perceived them to be. And, you know, you, you see people not putting gloves on. This happens to be a, uh, uh, a wounded battle soldier. But, you know, they're the the folks have no gloves on. They're they're working with their uh, shirts off. Uh, there's no masks. Um, while that's not what hopefully happens in our hospitals these days, we all know that we see breaches in in various uh, protocols all the time. Get them home, and you won't have those breaches. One of the other concepts that is often comes up when I talk about same day discharge is is it safe? Is it this? Is it that? Well, we just finished talking about the concept that the hospital is not a spa. Um, but the thing that people are often uh, struck by is that there's truly a hazard to staying in the hospital. This was a, um, this was a study done in uh, Victoria, Australia, um, just to give some credit to the far other side of the world on uh, almost a quarter million patients. And they looked at the, the relative hazard of each night in the hospital as far as skin ulcers, infections, and adverse drug reactions. And where it says one night in the hospital, that's an overnight stay. Um, so you, when their population stayed overnight in the hospital, there was a 2.4% chance that the, the patient would have some type of error made in their medication, 11.1% that they would pick up something from the hospital, urinary tract infection, resistant organisms, and uh, skin ulcer breakdown in, in about uh, one half percent, just from spending one night in one of our nice spas. So there, there's a risk, there's a true risk to staying in the hospital, and it's not necessarily the, the control arm, the, the safe arm. It's, there's a risk, and that's often not considered in, in the equation. So a lot of things are lining up for same-day care, as far as I'm concerned. Um, we've got the hazard of being in the hospital. You got the, the the trend all around the world to minimize costs and try to get maximum value for what we spend. There's um, improved PCI. PCI today is a whole lot different than PCI yesterday, and certainly a lot different than PCI 25 years ago. Things have improved, and then we also have reimbursement. At least in the United States, we no longer get reimbursed for inpatient procedures unless the patient now stays two midnights. So you can no longer game the system by keeping them in overnight. So essentially all elective angioplasties in the United States are outpatients. Now, if you want to keep your patient for overnight in the U.S., you get paid the same amount of money as if you send the patient home the same day. So either you get your whatever, $10,000 for four hours of care or $10,000 for 24 hours of care. And it doesn't take too sharp of an administrator to realize which is the better deal. So one of the things that people worry about is, are we just sort of throwing caution to the wind, trying to maximize the dollar once again, or the euro, or whichever currency we want to go for? Um, you know, have we really weighed the risks and, and benefits of pushing the time and piling up the money? Um, Certainly there's ischemia that we worry about. Are we, are we risking ischemia by sending people out the door quickly, bleeding? And um, what about the patient's education? You know, what, how are they going to learn? Um, as far as these risks are concerned, when you look at um, them, the question of ischemia, if you look at the risk of ischemic deaths, they're extraordinarily rare after about four hours post-PCI. If you look in most of the major clinical trials out there, there's events that show up early in the first few hours, and then there's events that start occurring after 24 hours. But there's a period from about four hours on where nothing really happens. And if the patient didn't already speak to you and tell you there was a problem, or you weren't observing problems, you probably aren't going to have a problem. And if an event occurs 24 or 48 hours after the procedure, keeping them overnight wouldn't have helped anyways. As far as bleeding, you know, the crowd here all knows that you don't bleed too frequently from TRI. And um, the femoralists who are not here today, I'm sure, um, will tell you that they're getting better and better at managing their growing sites so that their bleeding risk these days are much lower than they were uh, 10 or 15 years ago. 
as far as education, um, my patients, when I come in the next morning, look like this, deer staring in the headlights. They will say yes and agree to everything I tell them because they know that the quicker they nod their head yes, the quicker they'll get out the door. And after they've been kept up most of the night, after being treated with a bunch of sedating drugs the day before, um, their ability to comprehend anything, I think, is close to zero. Um, so while the nurse and staff may be going through a whole list of education, I think it's in one ear and out the other. So what about this pre-post uh, procedure risk thing? We hear a lot about, oh, let's, let's look at risk models. Let's see who these people are. We're going to look at their demographics, their underlying disease, and their procedure. And, and you can do this before you go to the cath lab and decide whether Mr. X or Mrs. X is at high risk or low risk. But once you've done your procedure, the field shifts. And that is, if you had a successful procedure, the risks didn't occur. So now to talk about how to manage the patient after the procedure without considering the procedure is really incorrect because the post-procedural risk models weigh very little on the patient demographic and underlying disease mm -hmm. and they're really dominated by what happened in the procedure. You could have a left main that you were really worried about before you went in, but after that well-placed stent went in and they had no complications and they were doing well, the outcome of this whole procedure is now based on that excellent result you got. So to, 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 as a prerequisite to tell a patient they can't go home the same day because they're too old or they got ugly disease or whatever, I think is, is false. You need to take a look at the patient after they finish their procedure. Patient's experience, as I alluded to earlier, is that this is not drive-through delivery. This is something different. And in several different pieces out there, you know, there's a, a great bit of patient satisfaction with going home the same day. In our patients who go home the same day, we can't get them to stay overnight again. They come back and they, they want to make sure before they get going that they're going to get home the same day. Um, there's a high adherence to discharge recommendations, although um, these studies all noted that there needs to be a system in place to make sure that the, um, the management was reinforced in the long run. Now, uh, uh, last year, a group of us uh, did a meta-analysis on all the same day versus overnight we could find. And we could find five randomized clinical trials, um, eight observational trials, um, about uh, over 100,000 patients. And you can see whether it's complications overall, MACE, or hospitalization. At the bottom, when you, when you crank it all through the statistics, there's really not a lot of difference between these. Now, the problem with this study was that it wasn't with so many, even with the over 100,000 patients, that's still not enough to resolve whether there's actually a difference. It doesn't look like there's a difference, and at least at this point in time, we can't see a difference. Um, but to truly put together a proper study to decide whether staying overnight or not is any better or worse would require over 300,000 patients, and I don't think anyone's going to sponsor that type of trial. We thought it was at least reassuring that, that despite analysis of over 100,000 patients, you're unable to show a hazard to uh, either approach. At our medical center, we tell the patients, you walk in today, you'll be home tonight, um, in general. Um, that is, our outpatients, if they come in and they don't otherwise have an indication to be admitted, they're going home tonight. Those are the feet of a uh, plaintiff attorney in his uh, wingtip shoes. Uh, he wanted to make sure he was going home tonight. He left his pants on. Um, it's driven by our nurse practitioners. Um, planning starts before admission. We tell these people when we schedule this that you're going home today. Don't forget, you're going, make sure your family's here. We don't want any what were called pop drops where you drop pop off and come back the next day. Um, make sure everyone knows that this is at 1980, that, that we are going home today. Um, the most important thing that we want to make sure is that there's social support available at home. Somebody is there to help that patient if they get into trouble on um, that night. We've not had to use that, but we feel that that's important. We can't send grandpa home to, you know, far off in the woods by himself. Um, 
we want an uneventful PCI procedure in hemostasis, um, and we do 24-hour follow-up by phone in all cases. So our, our two most important things are that they have someone home and that it was an uneventful PCI procedure and we didn't have any complications. And we've sent demented patients home. We've sent 95-year-olds home. In fact, most of the patients that were a little demented, their families actually wanted us to send them home because they were so afraid what would happen to the patient overnight in the hospital. And we've not had any issues with any of these patients as long as they've got good support at home and that they've got had an uneventful procedure. Um, comorbidities, as I put at the bottom, age, distance to travel, et cetera, are not fixed exclusions for anything. All right, so right now I think sending people home gives you a nice timely balance of, of speed and efficiency and also return on your uh, investment. Um, you can save, depending on what kind of paper you read, between 250 and 1,500 euros. Um, and you really increase the efficiency of your health care. You turn over your beds quicker. Leave the, your hospital beds open for someone that really needs it. The patient's happier. They get home. The family's happier. They don't have to make time the next day to come to the hospital and pick the patient up. Um, the doctor's happier because the doctor d doesn't get called for a problem with the patient at night because the patient's at home and doesn't have problems when they're at home. It's only when they're in the hospital and something happens you get called. So the doctor actually sleeps better too. So it's a win-win for everyone, as the old cliche is. So we've now seen the evolution of cath lab procedures go from the 1980s, where we admitted the day before a diagnostic procedure and discharged the day after the cath, to the 90s, where we admitted the day of the cath and um, PCI the next day and discharged after the PCI. Sometimes it was quite a bit after as we switched to Coumadin for stents. In the 2000s, we admitted the day of the cath slash PCI and discharged after the PCI. And then by the 210s, we were admitting routinely the day of the diagnostic and PCI with discharge all on the same day. And this was really driven by technical improvements with our equipment, patient satisfaction, need for efficiency, and now our payers. Uh, so in the end, uh, from the movie uh, The Wizard of Oz, as Dorothy's telling the, the good witch of the north, or whichever witch she was, that there's no place like home, and I'd like to add that. patients, um, we bring them in a little early for hydration. If they do well with the procedure and we're not concerned that we really overdid the contrast, our nurse practitioners will arrange for them to have uh, their renal function checked in a day or so. Um, if they're well hydrated, whether they're sitting in the hospital or whether they're at home isn't going to change too much for that. Um, but if they look like someone who's really teetering on the edge, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be held. We won't send that one home. But let's say the creatinine is, uh, the GFR is uh, you know, 20 or 30. You know, it's not really low, but it's not normal, sort of in the middle. Uh, most of those will go home the same day. But they may have been asked to come a little earlier for extra hydration and stay a little longer for a little hydration afterwards, make sure they're urinating, and send them home. But it, it's our nurse practitioners that are driving those and have taken ownership of watching the creatinine, pa patient's creatinine, so the docs, when they're busy, don't, you know, forget about that Mr. Jones had a high creatinine. There's, there's a nurse practitioner that knows that it's her job or his job to make sure that that gets followed through. And they're given the authority to keep the patient overnight if they want to. So, you know, if they can't find the doctors or the doctors are too busy and they're uncomfortable about the patient, they can just keep the patient overnight. Are there?